This is my DZO lens review, but I guess it is also a demonstration of what can go wrong when filming yourself. I found out that not only are some shots overexposed, but also that my audio from my lav mic was unusable due to a faulty cable, and my Sennheiser shotgun was a bit far away, so I had to reduce noise and EQ the hell out of it. This is what it sounded like. Cine lenses. They have properties that photography lenses usually don't have. Let's do that again. Cine lenses. They have properties that photography lenses usually don't have. They are designed to give you a cinematic look. Aperture is in T-stops and they're usually fully manual with gear rings. I own two of them. The DZO film 10 to 24 and the 20 to 70 T2.9 for micro four thirds. With their par focal design and some other standout features, I think they're awesome, but they do have some downsides as well. Let's talk about it. Now, before we get into the review of these lenses, let me tell you why I went for zoom lenses in the first place. What's often said about prime lenses is that if you want a closer shot or a different framing, you have to move your feet and move the camera. And I generally agree with that, and I do own some primes. But when I'm shooting for a wedding or documentary, which is the run and gun type of shooting, I don't want to have to swap lenses all the time. I don't like swapping lenses in general, but that's besides the point. Point is, I don't always have the possibility to move closer to my subject or the possibility to swap lenses all the time. Sometimes you just have no choice but to stay at a distance and zoom in for a tighter shot. And this is why I like to use zoom lenses a lot. With that out of the way, let's take a look at these Cine zooms. Cine lenses usually have a fully metal built and are relatively heavy. And that's no different with these. They weigh in at 1100 grams, but they're relatively compact for what they are and they have internal zoom. They're both exactly the same size and they have the gear rings in exactly the same places, making it easy to swap them. You don't have to adjust your follow focus or your lens support. There's a 77 millimeter filter thread on both, so you can use screw on ND filters. Little side tip here, if you're using ND filters on a wide angle lens like this one at the 10 millimeter end, it's always a good idea to use an ND filter with the same thread size as the thread size of the lens. You want to have the ND filter as close to the front element as possible. Because when you use a larger filter with step-up rings, it is going to vignette on the wide end. They're not weather sealed or resistant by any means, but that's pretty common with Cine style lenses. The focus, zoom and aperture rings are very nicely dampened and have hard stops. But the focus ring is really designed to use with a follow focus, which makes sense with a Cine lens. Using it with the hand is possible, of course, but it doesn't have quite enough resistance for that, in my opinion. It's a bit too light. The focus throw is 270 degrees. The zoom is 100 degrees and 55 degrees for the, of course, stepless aperture ring on the 20. 10 to 24 and 72 degrees on the 20 to 70. The dampening of all the rings is even throughout the throw, uh, which sometimes with, I have had some lenses where it's not quite even. There's like a, um, a point with a bit more resistance. The markings in metric values are on either side of the lens. And I do believe there is a Imperial version as well. They come with a plate and lens support and with this zoom lever that you can screw into the zoom ring. This really gives you a sense of how far you're zoomed in or out. Very useful. I don't use the provided lens support though, as it doesn't fit when the camera is in a cage. They also come with decent lens caps that don't fall off in your bag. Very nice. One of the features that stands out with both of these lenses is that they are optically parfocal, which means that when you are focused on your subject at say 25 millimeters, when you zoom in to say 70 millimeters, your subject will still be in focus without having to touch the focus ring. 
This is awesome to have, as you don't have to adjust your focus when you zoom in or out. Speaking of focus, something that can impact your image significantly when shooting video is focus breathing. Focus breathing is the change in the framing when you focus from close to far or vice versa. With some lenses, you'll get what looks like a slight crop when you zoom in. With these lenses though, the focus breathing is basically non-existent. It would only be slightly noticeable when focusing from the closest focusing distance to infinity in one go. But I mean, whoever does that kind of focus pull. The close focusing distance on these lenses is not that great. It's 60 centimeters on the 10 to 24 and 79 millimeters on the 20 to 70. What I do like about these lenses and one of the reasons why I picked them is that they have a constant aperture, meaning that the aperture stays the same across the whole zoom range. So when you have it set to T2.9 at 20 millimeters, it will still be T2.9 at 70 millimeters. This to me is very important, as I can keep the same amount of light coming into the lens and therefore keeping the exposure the same, regardless of the focal length. Plus, I keep the same depth of field, as far as the effect that aperture has on that goes. There are of course more factors that play a role in that, but that's for another video. These lenses also have very little distortion, most visible at the wide end of the 10 to 24, but it's very minimal. On Cine lenses, the aperture is indicated by T-stops. It means that both lenses have the exact same light transmission, hence the T. So the exposure at a given T-stop will be exactly the same on both lenses, given that all the other variables like lighting, camera settings are the same. It makes it much easier to match shots made with these lenses, but not limited to these lenses. Any lens with T-stops will have the exact same light transmission at a given T-stop. So for example, this Zhongyi Speedmaster 17mm T1.0 that I'm shooting this on will have the exact same exposure at T2.9 in terms of aperture as these DZO lenses. There is noticeable chromatic aberration, but it's soft and I like the character of it. It's most visible in backlit situations, as you'd expect. Both lenses have significant flaring. It's something that you like or you don't. I do quite like the flares these lenses produce. And because of the 12 aperture blades, the sun stars are also very nice in my opinion. Those 12 aperture blades also mean that the bokeh is super smooth and soft. I absolutely love it and I really think these lenses stand out when it comes to bokeh. That also brings me to color rendition and the overall look that these lenses produce. I absolutely love the images that I get with these lenses. I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but whatever you have framed up and in focus seems to really pop. Maybe that's the 3D pop people talk about. Together with the fact that these lenses are not clinically sharp and produce really nice colors, the whole image has a certain, let's call it, filmic character and quality to it. Now let's have a look at the practical use side of these lenses. These lenses have no optical image stabilization, which means that I rely on the IBIS in my cameras. I use them both on my GH6 and on my G9, but here's where a manual zoom lens can complicate things a bit. You see, whenever you use a manual non-stabilized lens with the GH6, G9 or most other cameras that have IBIS, you need to tell the camera what focal length you're using so it knows what kind of image it needs to correct for. But with a zoom lens, the focal length can vary. So basically, in order for the IBIS to work properly, you need to set the focal length every time you zoom in or out. Now, to a certain extent, in real-world use, 
it's not as big of a deal as it might seem. There are some settings you can use and some workarounds. IBIS on both of these lenses is excellent. In my experience, there's little difference between the G9's IBIS and the G8-6's IBIS. They both handle these non-stabilized lenses very well. But the G8-6 does have an advantage here. The menu for setting the focal length on the G8-6 has the ability to set a list of focal lengths as presets. And that list can be mapped to a custom button, which I did. This makes switching to a different focal length very quick. The G9, on the other hand, doesn't have that. It does have a menu where you can set your focal length, but no presets apart from the three default presets, 24, 35, and 50 millimeters. So even though you could map that menu to a custom button, you will still have to manually enter the correct focal length every time you change it. The best way that I found to balance IBIS performance with usability depends on the camera I'm using. When I'm using the G9 with these lenses, it will be in situations where I don't need to zoom a lot or where stabilization is not so important, like when I'm using it on a tripod. I will set the focal length and I'm good to go. I can still zoom in or out a little bit, staying close to the focal length that I've set, and the IBIS will still do a good job. Of course, the longer the focal length, the more noticeable any movement will be, with any lens, really. On the G86, as I said, I have a few focal lengths set to the presets, mapped to one of the custom buttons. This way I can quickly change focal length when I need to. In my experience, you don't need to set the exact focal length every time, as long as it's close enough. So, for example, when I have it set to 25 millimeters, I will be able to use the zoom between 20 and 30 or even 35 millimeters, and the IBIS will still do a good job. On top of that, what I've found works extremely well on both cameras is turning on IS lock whenever you don't need to pan or tilt with the camera very much. This definitely adds a significant amount of extra stabilization. If you don't know what IS lock is or how it works, you could watch my video about stabilization. I'll link it in the description. You can still zoom in or out with these lenses, uh, even if you don't set the right focal length. And I haven't seen anything weird happen because of that, other than less stable footage. But I'd say if you can, set the focal length whenever possible, or set it to somewhere in the middle of the range you're gonna be zooming within. I do very much wish that companies would make cine lenses with electrical contacts that would at least communicate the focal length to the camera. That would make life so much easier. Another thing to think about with these lenses is operating them in terms of focus and zoom. As I mentioned, the focus ring is nicely dampened, but lightly. For me, it's a bit too lightly for operating with my hand on the ring. It is, however, perfect when using a follow focus, like this small rig one. The zoom ring, on the other hand, is fine to use by hand. It's a bit more dampened and you can make some very smooth zooms with it. Now, I don't usually zoom during a shot, but if you want, you can get some really nice smooth zooms. Now, to some of you, these lenses might not be what you're looking for. But if you shoot weddings and documentary stuff, these lenses are, I think, a very good affordable option. For me, these lenses as a set cover a very useful focal range from 10 millimeters all the way to 70 millimeters. And they also have the overlap from 20 to 24 millimeters, which can be useful in a multi-camera setup. And the fact that they're optically parfocal means that I have one thing less to worry about when I'm zoom zooming in or out. Speaking of a multi-camera setup, these lenses match in terms of color rendition and light transmission, which makes life easier when exposing a shot and matching them in post-production. Now, they're not the fastest lenses at T2.9, but fast enough for me in most cases. And if I need to occasionally do some very low light stuff or some very shallow depth of field stuff, I'll use a faster lens for that, like this Zhongyi, Zhongyi, like this Zhongyi 17 mm T1.0. I think the filmic image quality, the super smooth bokeh, the absence of focus breathing, the smooth zoom, and the constant aperture 
make these lenses a joy to shoot with. And you can get some really good looking footage with the G8 VI or the G9. It's really unlike anything I've ever seen with any of the other lenses that I've used. It might be a bit hard to notice on YouTube though. You might be wondering, why didn't you go with the Panasonic Leica 10 to 25 and the 25 to 50 f1.7? Well, for a few reasons. The first being the focal range. For me, the 25 to 50 is a bit limited. It's a bit too tight on the wide end and really not telephoto enough on the long end. So that's where the DZO film 20 to 70 was a more compelling option for me. And the Leica 10 to 25 has a good equivalent in this 10 to 24 from DZO. And because this one would match that one, it, it made sense to go for this one instead of the Panasonic Leica. Also, having optically parfocal lenses has proven to be very valuable in terms of usability. And having true linear focus with hard stops makes you really get a feel for where the focus is or needs to be. The Leica lenses do have linear focus as well, and they are sort of parfocal, but it's all done electronically, which could cause some drift. These DZO lenses really need to be on a rig though, with a lens support and a follow focus. So if you're someone who likes to use just a camera body with a lens and nothing else, these lenses are probably not for you. And as I said, they don't have any weather sealing so you'll need to cover them when you're shooting out in bad weather conditions. I have to say, I also got these DZO lenses at a really good deal. I bought them new, but they were on offer for a considerably lower price than I would have paid for the set of Leica lenses, like a, a few hundred less. Overall, I think with these lenses, you get excellent image quality, excellent handling, Consistency in terms of aperture, color rendition, and light transmission, and a very useful focal range at a reasonable price. So what do you think about these lenses? Or do you have any questions? Let me know in the comments. I hope this video was helpful. If so, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel and maybe hit that notification bell. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. Cine lenses, cine lenses. Cine lenses.